Again, welcome to Providence. Uh, if you would join me in the call to worship that is printed in your bulletin. We gather today to worship the one who created us. The one who calls us. The one who equips us. The one who loves us from now and With joyful hearts, let us worship God. Good morning. And our poem for the day is called, The Thing Is. It's by Ellen Bass. To love life, to love it even when you have no stomach for it, and everything you've held dear crumbles like burnt paper in your hands, your throat filled with the silt of it. When grief sits with you, its tropical heat thickening the air, heavy as water more fit for gills than lungs. When grief weighs you like your own flesh, only more of it, an obesity of grief. You think, how can a body withstand this? Then you hold life like a face between your palms, a plain face, no charming smile, no violet eyes, and you say, yes, I will take you, I will love you again. And join me in the prayer of illumination. Lord, we thank you for bringing us together this morning to worship you and to hear your word. We ask that you be with us, that you open our hearts and our minds and our eyes to see and hear what you have to say to us through your word. And it might help if I had the Bible to do this. Our first scripture is Psalm 111. It's praise for God's wonderful works. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them, full of honor and majesty in his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has gained renown by his wonderful deeds. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He is ever mindful of his covenant. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the heritage of nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. And our New Testament gospel reading is from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 20. Be careful, then, how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time, because the days are evil. So do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. As you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts, giving thanks to God the Father at all times and for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. The word of the Lord. Hi, kids. I know there are not any that we can see today, but there might be some on Zoom, so we're going to do a children's message. I think that one of the greatest God's gifts, one of the greatest gifts that God has given us is the gift of music. Have you ever heard of a composer named Johann Sebastian Bach? Bach lived about 250 years ago, and he is considered by many people to be one of the greatest composers who ever lived. 
although there is debate about that, so don't quote me. You might be surprised to learn that some of Bach's music is still in our hymnals today. Whenever Bach wrote a piece of music, he always liked to write the letters S, D, G at the bottom of the music. Those letters stand for the words soli deo gloria, which means to God alone be the glory. You see, Bach realized that his music was a gift from God and that he had a responsibility to use his gift to the glory of God. Music is a very, import, a very important part of our worship. The Bible says, speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your hearts to the Lord. But did you know that there was a time in church history where the only people who sang were the pastor and the others who stood in front of the church? That's right. Back in the 1400s, most people weren't taught the tune or the words to religious songs, even though many of them associated music with church because the entire service except for the sermon was sung. However, a man named Martin Luther thought that was silly, and he decided to start a new type of church where music was very important. He thought that everyone should learn music and that everyone should be given the opportunity to sing. Many of Bach's songs are inspired by Luther's music because Luther was also a composer, and much of his music was sung in his new church because music for a congregation hadn't really been invented before Luther. Bach was a follower of Luther's new church and so used many of Luther's songs as a template. Both Bach and Luther believed that singing was a wonderful way to glorify God. Who knew that getting to sing in church was a privilege that we had to earn and work for and not just something we always had to do? You know what I think? I think that we should stop singing quietly. Sometimes in Presbyterian churches, we like to sing a little bit quietly. But I think that we should sing loud and proud because we're singing for God and to God be the glory. Will you pray with me? <laughs> Thank you, God, composer of the universe, for the gift of music. Help us to remember that music is something you love to hear from us, whether it's on key or off key, whether we know the tune or the words or not, and that when we sing, we are glorifying you. Help us to remember to sing out with joy as we sing hymns in church, because we are so lucky to be able to sing our praises to you. In your name we pray, amen. As Cassie already said, my name is Steve Heald. I am a deacon here at Providence Presbyterian and have been blessed for the last six years to participate in this congregation. Uh, and I hope that at least one thing I say today blesses you. But before I start, I want to correct something that Cassie said. Um, there is a sign-up sheet on the board to sign up for food for the AI group that meets at 6 o'clock. And she respected her elders and said she didn't know the time. But she did know the time because I told her it was 6.30. So... Um, we both stand corrected. It is six o'clock. Um, you know, I've had the opportunity to uh, preach here several times, and it was different this time than those first times. Uh, the first time was when David left. I felt that it was really important to teach on that the value of this congregation is the people that are sitting out in the audience not the person who is in the pulpit. And then later we did one on the song uh, about faith, uh, It Is Well With My Soul. And we did another one on the prodigal son, where the approach was to look at it from the point of view of the older son, not the younger son. And then the last one I did, I remember, was right after George Floyd was murdered, and we talked about race and changing our attitude about treating people that are different than we are. But today, I came in with really no topic. Uh, I felt like God had moved me in those earlier sermons. And for some reason, it wasn't clicking. There wasn't a topic. So I have to tell you that preparing for the sermon today was very difficult. Um, it's not easy. And I guess part of that is the older I get, 
the harder it is to remember and to think. Um, so I decided to talk today about politics. Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, you know, the point I would like to make is comparing the extremes. There are good people in the world. There are bad people in the world. And then there's people in the middle. There are left-wing, right-wing politics. There's Democrats, Republicans. There's conservative. There's liberal. But there's a ton of people in the middle. And some of those people in the middle will look at the politics or the good and the bad, and they'll say, thank God I'm in the middle because I don't want to be out on either end of that spectrum. But what constitutes the middle? What is thinking in the middle? You know, in 12-step programs, they talk about a lot of things, but one of the primary topics is about gratitude, being thankful. And there's a lot of virtues that apply to that. Patience is one, thoughtfulness, being a good listener. But maybe most important, it's giving grace without somebody earning that grace, giving it freely. And it's easy to be thankful when things go well. It is really hard to be thankful when things are not going well. All we have to do in this church is look at our prayer list and realize there are difficult situations. We worry about our health. Maybe it's a job. Maybe it's an ailing parent. Maybe it's a grandchild or a child that's going through difficulty. A friend, COVID-19 in the last couple of years, there are difficult circumstances in this world and it's hard to look at the trials we face and be thankful. But I wanted to look at the scripture in Psalms and point out a few things to you to think about. Psalms literally is, means a poem sung to a musical instrument. The word Psalms comes from the Hebrew word tehillim and the Greek word psalmos. There are over 100, there are 150 psalms written over a period of about 300 years. 73 of the psalms are attributed to King David. Now, they will debate the authorship of many of the psalms, and it doesn't matter who wrote them. It's important that we focus on the message. They are all messianic in nature, messianic in nature. In other words, they are talking about the coming of the Lord and teaching about the deity and value of our Lord Jesus Christ. They talk about what has been done, which is history, but they talk about what will be done and the need for God to participate in those things that are coming. Many Psalms are referred to as acrostic, and all that means is they begin in successive letters of the Hebrew language. First verse is the one letter, the next letter in the language starts the next verse. Psalms 111 is one of those acrostic psalms. Many of the psalms were compiled by the minor prophets Ezra and Nehemiah. And the common theme is justice, righteousness, and mercy. The lessons, justice, righteousness, and mercy should apply to not just people, but to religion and surprisingly to government. Some Psalms are more famous than others. Psalms 23, many of you could re recite by memory. Other Psalms we sing repeatedly in songs in church. But none of those Psalms are more quoted or referenced than the psalm that was in the scripture this morning, Psalms 111. Psalms 111 emphasizes the necessity of reverence and obedience in our worship. Gracious, merciful power of his works and faithfulness 
thoughtfulness, and it mentions fear of the Lord. It is written from King David to God saying, I understand what your message is. And the key, we are to seek God not through our works, but with our mind and study and understanding of faith. And I want to reference that reference to fear. Fear is the beginning of wisdom and understanding. And therefore, lack of fear is a lack of understanding and a sign of disobedience to what God is teaching. Now, Ephesians was credited to the Apostle Paul. And again, some will question that due to the choice of words or some of the phraseology. But it it really doesn't matter, again, who wrote it. What matters is what it's saying. And it's either a direct letter to the Ephesians, the city of Ephesus, or it's a kind of a circle letter that was intended to benefit all of Asia Minor. History tells us there were about 300,000 people in that city, and the church was a very small part of that, just beginning. People in that time frame were students of history, and the Old Testament lessons were passed down, taught, followed, and believed. And what Paul was teaching here is that they were now filled with the Spirit and needed to rely not on the history, but upon their faith. Remember, Psalms was written by David to God. This passage is God speaking through the author to the people. But note, the message of these two passages is the same. And the last verse tells us the key to what I hope I'm saying today. Give thanks to God in faith and trust the Lord Jesus Christ. The poem David chose for me exemplifies this lesson as well. When life's trials weigh us down, we ask ourselves, how can I do this? And we take it on knowing God will love us again, no matter what. When we were preparing to do this, John and I met with David on a couple of occasions to talk about preaching, what it meant to us, what we were trying to do. And when he asked that question, I don't remember what John said, but I remember what I said. And my answer was, it was to teach. And I decided when I was preparing for this sermon, that's not the right answer. Uh, I gave him a second answer, and that was to motivate. But I've also decided that that's not the right answer. I can't teach what I find hard to do myself. If in my own life I can't be grateful and thankful when times are tough, I can't teach you how to do it. And I can't motivate anyone when I'm not motivated to follow what God is teaching to do. But what I can do is turn to the scriptures and turn to these lessons and say, let's look at these, let's hear them, let's follow them, let's believe them, let's trust in them. Bart Millard was a young, promising football player in Texas in the mid-90s. His mother abandoned him when he was 12 years old and left him with an abusive, vindictive, angry, violent father. Bart suffered a football injury and he's in high school and had to give up playing sports. And when he got out of high school, he immediately left home and he turned to music. He joined a band, they toured the country, trying to be successful, hired an agent. It was a tough grind for him as an individual. On top of not having a mother in his life and a father who he literally hated. The band struggled. Bart found out that his father had cancer and was dying. 
But he also found out or he heard that his father had made some changes. His father had found Christ. Bart left the band, went home to spend time with his father. And it started out very rocky. But he stayed and he talked to his dad. They reconciled and he realized that his father had changed because he found Christ. His father passed away in 1998. And in 1999, Bart wrote a song that I'm sure you've all heard. I can only imagine. He went back to his band. That band became the band Mercy Me. And for the last 23 years, they have been one of the prominent Christian bands in this country. Bart always had a faith. And it was a turning point in his life for him to see his father get that faith. And a group of us were lucky last week to hear this band at Coors Field, Mercy Me. And I had no intention of using the song, I Can Only Imagine. But I heard a song that I wanted to try and incorporate into this message. So we go online, we start looking, I can't find it. All I had was a couple words out of the song. But in looking at their songs, I discovered something. I found a song called Bring the Rain. And it says, people ask how circumstances change who I am. The rainbow follows. The song Flawless says, no matter the bumps and bruises and scars, God can lead the way. And the song, Even If, says, some you win, some you lose, but faith guides every day. Without exceptions, the band songs are about dealing with adversity through faith. Bart credits his success with handling all of the trials because his faith was there first and strong. He just had to trust it. Something he said Sunday in his little testimony towards the end of the conference stuck with me, and I hope it sticks with you. No matter what great things we do, God loved us before we did those great things. And no matter how badly we screw up, He'll love us again after the mistake. And I apologize to you for the title of this sermon. I got the title wrong. The good, the bad, and the thankful. I picked the wrong full word because the word should have been faithful. If we're going to be thankful in all circumstances, even when there's adversity, We have to be faithful first. Our faith has to give us the strength to understand that there's a teaching moment in that adversity and that that teaching moment will strengthen that faith. And maybe the next time there's another adversity, we have more faith and we'll face it easier. The answer to giving thanks in adversity is in the scripture. And if we don't have the faith to trust the word of God, no one standing up here is going to make that an easy process for me or for anyone else. God is the answer. And if we're going to change our habits, it's because we trust and have faith in him. If his words don't motivate us, Nothing will. And the people said, amen. Please go today and remember that the service is over, but the work just begins when we leave this sanctuary. Thank you for coming today.